Hi, welcome everybody. I'm Sandy Kowalczyk, Growth and Business Development Manager at the Council for Professional Recognition. And my work has a focus on ECE collaboration with states, associations, and high school CTE programs. And I'm so happy today to welcome you, Dr. Biza Baton Lewis, who I have collaborated with in the past, most notably a couple months ago, back in April, when we launched our high school um, CTE CDA handbook, which we'll talk about later in the program. But uh, but I'll throw it to you now to tell our audience a little bit more about yourself and your background. Well, I'm Bisa Lewis. Um, I have so many different things I do. Uh, those who know me say, how, you, how do you do it all? But I do things that are interesting to me and that align with my, my life goals and definitely my talents uh, where I know I can help other people. So uh, I'm the president of Black Child Development Institute Atlanta, uh, a local affiliate of the National Black Child Development Institute. I was elected president in 2018. Uh, and before that, I served as vice, vice president for about four years. I also, for about 20 years, over 20 years now, uh, I have a consulting training company, Ideal Early Learning, uh, which birthed Wings Curriculum. Uh, Wings Curriculum is a curriculum for uh, birth to age five. So Ideal Early Learning, we were doing training, uh, Sandy, and, you know, one company or one organization, one school may contract to do a training on a curriculum or assessment or lesson planning. And I was thinking, man, there's so much more I would like to train them on so they can get the whole comprehensive picture, right? right. So these curriculum was birthed from that because I wanted to make sure that whether I trained your staff for two hours or I'd never trained your staff at all, that you had an all-in-one place of what to do with children. So uh, WINGS curriculum uh, was birthed from that. So WINGS is an acronym for Wonder, Interest, Needs, Goals, and Skills. We use the W-I-N, the one <laughs> with the needs of children, to teach the GS, their goals and skills. So uh, again, the training and consulting with I Do Early Learning led to that. In addition to my CDA work, so uh, I've been teaching CDA CDA, doing CDA training for, for a couple of decades now, I believe, uh, near that. And from that, again, I wanted to make sure that everyone had um, a book to go by or several books to go by guides for based on what their uh, needs were in the early learning profession. No, thank you so much. And I love the WINGS acronym too. That's fabulous. And I must say, um, you know, Dr. Beasley, you've worked with the council many times in the past. And in, in addition to our webinar a few months ago that I mentioned, you actually helped create the book with us. So I thank you for that. <laughs> and so for all of you guys tuned in today, on most council live episodes, we focus on one CDA functional area, such as program management, professionalism, or creativity. But today we're mixing things up a bit by focusing on a topic that touches upon all of our core competency functional areas and which is central to your work, Dr. Biza. And that topic is cultivating a culturally responsive ECE workforce, huge topic. Um, and it's critically important, and I know our audience is eager for us to dive into this, but before that, um, just given what you just said, explaining your background and so forth, we'd love to hear what led you to the early childhood education field and what animates and inspires you today. And then, did you ever experience one of those light bulb moments um, when you realized that ECE is your passion? Yes, Sunny, I, I love that question. <laughs> because I was one who uh, didn't know what I wanted to major in in college. I changed my major four times. All I knew was that I love math. So <laughs> they did accounting. Uh, right. And then uh, I was finding people who were doing accounting and, you know, didn't have a degree. And I know there are CPAs and different types of accountants. So I said, I want to do something else. So I majored in computer science back when there was no internet. <laughs> <laughs> We were programming in Cobalt Pascal. Eventually, I went to Sandy Middle Grades Education because I was afraid of the little ones at first. You know, I didn't want to break one, uh, the children. So I majored in middle grades. And then uh, one of my college professors, I shout out to Denise Burston. I write about her in one of my uh, books, The Paid Educator. But she influenced me because she said I had a bubbly personality and that children would love me. I had teachers in my family as well that I didn't even realize how far back uh, we had educators in our family. And so I changed my major to early childhood education and you know the rest is history but that light bulb moment for me 
uh, that I knew I had found the right places when, uh, whether it's parents or educators, I uh, come with questions. I seem to know what's best for children and children gravitate towards me. And when I work with them, there's that mutual respect. The child in me comes out. So I knew I was in the right place when I started doing my, my practicum and internship experiences in college. I said, wow, I really do love the little ones. And so from there, <laughs> here we go. I've been going to <laughs> Well, we are very glad you changed your field from, from the computer science information technology. Uh, and I, I will attest to that with your personality. I think um, that, that was obviously a fabulous choice and a wonderful thing for your career. Um, so as an acclaimed author, professor, and public speaker, you share that diversity, equity, and inclusion are core values that inform all you do. For our audience members that are less familiar with your work, why are these values important to you? And why do you feel they're important for all early educators to understand? Well, I, I love that question as well, because here uh, in our world, the world is so diverse. Our country is so diverse. Uh, it's even more diverse from when it was when I was a child. Uh, so it's important that the children who are, who are in our classrooms, the families that we must engage, the stakeholders that we must engage, that we know how to do that appropriately. It doesn't mean that we have to know everything about their culture. It just means we have to be open-ended in our practices and respectful considering what their cultures are. And oftentimes we go from just traditional American culture uh, when it comes to our curriculum and you know whatever we're doing in our classrooms and in our programs. So we have to remember that there, the world is made up of so many different people, some from different places, but even though you are born here in America, your family is different. Your language right. may be different at home. What you eat is different. What you wear is different. So people, um, what, what makes the world go round and what makes the world so exciting and a wonderful place is those differences. And so we need to start considering those and honoring those and making sure what we do in our practices and education that we encompass, embrace, celebrate those in our daily operations and activities, experiences with children and families. Yeah, no, that's so, so important. I mean, I personally agree with that. And here at the council, diversity and inclusion are also amongst our highest priorities, both internally as well as in our prep with, you know, ECE educators through our CDA credentialing process. And right now, we're actually even honored to partner with the Children's Equity Project, which has received a grant for Trust for Learning uh, to focus on increasing the knowledge, awareness, and understanding of early educators on the issues of equity, bias, and systemic racism. Uh, importantly, too, our CEO, Dr. Moore, Dr. Kelvin Moore, has expressed there is unfortunately very a lot of structural, structural inequities in the care and education field. And it come, when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion in the ECE workforce, what do you believe are the biggest challenges facing the sector today? It's so important. It's definitely the lack of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, we have to realize that those differences are there and it's important to teach them. I uh, recently had a, a meeting with uh, some of our state leaders and, you know, told them, hey, you know, it's, we, we more, we're more concerned about what happens when no one is looking. Uh, so me and my team, we're letting them know some of the calls and emails and experiences we hear about in BCI and Black Child Development Institute Atlanta that they would never hear about uh, at the state level. So it's important that we show people how uh, that people are not scary. You know, right. True you want to be loved. They simply want a relationship with you. And there are some cultural differences that you may not understand, but that's why it's important to get to know the people you're working with, the families. Invite them in to sing their songs, to, um, to read their stories, to talk about family experiences and history that's important to them. And um, we have at BCI Atlanta, we're doing a series called Cultivate the Genius of Black Children. Uh, mm. Dr. Deborah R. Sullivan uh, wrote a book called Cultivating the Genius of Black Children, Learning to lead as well. She has several books and articles out there. Uh, she's a former president of BCI Seattle. And one thing Dr. Sullivan said that resonated with everyone in one of our trainings, is five, it's a five-part series, uh -huh. uh, she said that the only system that was developed with uh, Black people specifically in mind was slavery. Mm. 
And here lately, I think about watching the news. I'm also thinking the criminal justice system. Um, so with all of that being, um, thinking about that just goes, you make, it makes you go, wow. You know, where are we in this world and what can we change to ensure that we're thinking about everyone with all the systems that we create, especially in education, because these children will be the ones standing to go on and take care of us. They'll be our nurses. They'll be our attorneys. Uh, they'll be uh, any who work with our children as well. And we want to make sure that they are educated, they are respected, that they grow up feeling confident in their abilities because we need them all. No, we absolutely need them on that. They're, the age range we're working with here is like such an impressionable age. I mean, more so than any any other age group, I think. So, so important. Mm -hmm. um, so on to one of our next questions. One of the CDA functional areas focuses on program management, and you've created a vast array of resources through your WINGS curriculum, which you mentioned earlier. Um, to provide educators and directors with systems for organizing and implementing developmentally and culturally appropriate practices based on young children's um, interests, needs, and skill levels. So why do you feel that a culturally responsive curriculum is important to these programs? If we truly want to ensure that children will be successful, at their, in all domains of development, uh, especially social emotional development, we forget about social emotional, I call it the hidden curriculum. Because yeah, true. they don't really see it and they can't recite it like the alphabet or their numbers, mm -hmm. but it's there, that social emotional piece. So it's important that we understand that uh, cultural diversity, equity, inclusion is embedded throughout the curriculum, even though we have focus areas. Um, when I do the CDA training, Sandy, I make sure that I embed diversity, uh, coach responsibility in every area because families, even though families is one of the functional, uh, one of the areas, right? There are diverse families, right? Program management, there are diverse programs. You have family child care providers. Every home is different based on where they are. That's the difference, right? Um, also, child care centers, there are different types of child care centers. You know, who's who's there? What, what is, what's the makeup of the staff? What's the makeup of the children and the families? So in every single um, functional area, there are 13 functional areas, as we know, uh, six competency standards for the CDA. I embed diversity, equity, inclusion in all of them. And at the college level, um, my years in the college level doing the same thing because there is no one class on cultural responsiveness. And if there is, right. it doesn't have to be. It has to be embedded in everything. If you're teaching assessment, you need to talk about differences. If you're teaching uh, the curriculum class, uh, science for young children, math for young children, cultural responsiveness has to be embedded throughout. And lastly, even inclusion, Sandy, because people don't realize some of the recommendations that we make uh, and philosophies we believe in in early childhood education, uh, they don't go over well when it comes to children with special needs. And that can also vary based on what the special need is. Yeah, no, I'm so happy you brought that up because mm -hmm. special needs is key. Yeah, and we think about inclusion. Inclusion is, is not primarily about uh, cult culture. It's primarily about uh, the needs of the ch individual needs of the children, diagnosed or not. And mm -hmm. for instance, I'll give a quick example. Mm -hmm. uh, you know how in ECE and even in, in Wings curriculum, um, when we tell children, there, for instance, there are nine uh, preschool learning centers in Wings. There are nine toddler learning centers. There are six infant learning centers. So there's a point in the day uh, in early child education where the children get to choose their learning center. And as long as they clean up in that center, you know, they can safely go to another center. Well, right. the child has a certain special need and based on the severity of that need, you don't want to give them nine centers to choose from. And so right. that's where, you know, Wings, we make sure this is important as well. You may give them two choices and say, uh, John, which center do you want to go to now? You want to go to art or do you want to go to the block area? And once he's done in that area that he chooses, okay, John, where would you like to go now? But giving him nine centers to choose from based on his special need uh, and his uh, the severity of that need. It's important that everything we say in early childhood education does not always match in, in inclusion and special needs. So that's why this education is so important. And people need to make sure, Sandy, lastly, they get quality CDA training. Let me say that again. Definitely. <laughs> they need to get quality 
CDA training from a professional. I love that you guys have that system up there where you check because yeah, the gold standard. Our the gold, gold standard, standard. yeah. It's important <laughs> because you want to make sure whoever you are hiring um, in your program that they have had quality training and not just the piece of paper. Yeah, no, absolutely. That is so, so important. Um, so thank you for that. And um, it was even wonderful for me to hear more about your week's curriculum because I knew about it, but it's, you know, thank you for the in-depth description as well. Um, so another important element of our program management is family engagement. What advice do you have for early educators and program directors who want to engage more meaningfully with parents and families within your program? Invite them in, <laughs> involve them, invite them in. And, you know, they want to come in. So the drop off and pick up, you have to extend your curriculum beyond that. Uh, every month, uh, when I was a director, uh, I made sure Head Start, Pre-K, wherever I was director, lab schools, I made sure that every month we had at least one family engagement activity whether it was um, reading stories outside on the lawn and having a, a grab and go lunch and or some type of activity every single month during and or after school, sometimes before school because parents have different schedules. So I promise you, no matter what you're teaching, no matter mm -hmm. what you're incorporating in your classroom, parents, they have something that they can offer to support you. So invite them. It's simple. And then you don't have to go on Google and find everything to learn about their culture. It's important to know some things, but here's right. the things: Even within cultures, people are different. Mm -hmm. you know, I remember being in the airport in Miami and, you know, there are a lot of people who look like me in there and I'm mm -hmm. a talker. So speaking to several people mm -hmm. and most of them did not speak the same language I spoke or they had a, a different accent. Mm -hmm. And it just reminded me of how, even though we may look the same, there are so many differences in our world and they are gorgeous. They are beautiful if mm -hmm. we embrace them. So your homework, guys, is every single month, and I do this in training too, is I have the uh, family service uh, advocates, I have the uh, directors, I have the teachers to come up with a calendar, put them in groups, and every month they have to say, uh, tell what will be your activity for this month based on what you're studying in your classroom. Yeah, no, that's fabulous. And the prompt is good because kids need that. And I mean, family engagement in itself is so, so important to have the you know parents there and even to have the teachers and the educators be aware of their students' family it, it, and just getting to know them more one-on-one -on -one that it's all around. And may, may I add also on the BCI Atlanta side, Sandy, we have a program called Powerful Families that we launched last Oh, neat. Week. Families are powerful, right? Yeah. And we can make, make sure they know how to embrace that power as well and move forward with it. So Powerful Families is a two-generation, two-gen innovation project, uh, partly funded through DECAL, Department of Early Care and Learning here in Georgia. Uh, and with Powerful Families, we work with uh, the YMCA, Fulton County Public Schools, we work with uh, sheltering arms, different programs, helping their educators, their family advocates, as well as parents involved in that as well, helping the parents to improve their lives, set goals and improve their lives along with the children. So that two-gen approach, the parents are improving themselves while mm -hmm. they're helping the children. So uh, quickly, uh, we have three goals. They set a uh, family slash personal goal that they want to achieve, and we pull together the resources to help them to do that. They have an educational goal. You know, do you have a, do you want to get a certain credential, a certain degree? Right. We help you with that. And then also they have a career goal. What do you really want to do at this point, at this season in your life? And we help them achieve that as well. Alongside that, the child component is teaching them about appropriate literacy practices. Uh, we give them backpacks full of books, children's books, uh, through our Read to Succeed program. And we also uh, have workshops on child development and early learning so they know what's appropriate for their children at home, uh, as well as what's appropriate in the school. So I just want to make sure I mentioned powerful families because that's our primary family engagement program. Yeah, no, that's fabulous. And it's amazing. They do so many things. And, you know, with the career pathways and everything that you just explained, I think that's a valuable information piece for our audience today. So thank you for adding that. Um, and before we wrap up today, I'd like to turn the conversation to a topic that I both you and I are excited about, our high school CDA. 
And for our audience, <laughs> exactly, for our audience members who didn't attend our um, CDA handbook launch and webinar back in April, uh, Dr. Biza provides, in addition to everything else she mentioned today, <laughs> provides guidance to school systems, CTE leaders, and ECE instructors across the nation to help them implement CDA, CTE high school programs. So, Dr. Biza, what inspires your work with high school CDA, CTE programs, and why do you feel that respecting the entire ECE career path starting in high school is vital for administrators, early educators, and policymakers? First of all, Sandy, I'm so excited about the, the guide, the handbook. You guys, it is free. Free! It is. So make sure you go on the website and you, and you access it. Um, I love high schoolers because they are so ready. They are ripe, Sandy. They are ready mentally, they're ready physically, they're ready socially, emotionally to dig in and work with children. Many of them are doing it anyway. They have brother, young brothers and sisters at home. Some of them are, um, are babysitting anyway for extra money. And in the high school program, I was blessed, I'll say, to uh, work <laughs> in the high school, school system uh, in, in Gwinnett County Public Schools, our largest school district. and Working with high schools for three years, I was wondering why I was back in the high school. I won't even say back now. Right. I loved this work because their lesson plans were so creative. Uh, all the work that they did in the program was so creative. And when I uh, allowed them to go, we had a, 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 a chakra center, corporate chakra center across the street. So I would take them over there. Oftentimes we make puzzles, we read stories. They were so good at it. <laughs> they were ready for it. And they got hired. Many of them were working in after-school programs. So we need for the ECE pathway to start before college. We need it to start at the high school level because they not only can they work well, they want to work well. And mm -hmm. especially in post-COVID, uh, Sandy, um, people, we get calls all the time where at BC Atlanta, where people can't find people to work. They can't find teachers. They can't find um, people to work in the classroom or administrators even. People are either doing other things they found during the pandemic or they, um, you know, there are a number of reasons that we could say that people are not returning to the classroom. And right. so we need those high schoolers. We need for the high school programs to be a feeder into our pathway, uh, whether it's a technical college or a four-year college. We need for you to start earlier and get them interested in the program. So uh, wherever you are, I highly recommend you partner with your local CTE um, program, your career and technical education program, because they're ripe and ready. And then lastly, I'll say uh, that it's important to have all the stakeholders involved because they want to be involved. Uh, and again, we talk about all of this in the handbook. Uh, there are all kinds of resources in there to support you from the beginning of, should I even do this here in my, <laughs> in my district? And if I am going to do it, how can I uh, do interest surveys and, and move forward and find funding to implement the program? So I love the idea of the high schoolers. Again, I think that they are the future of our workforce and we need to make sure that we include them and educate them. And the CDA is a great way to do that. No, absolutely. Thank you for, for that. And I agree 100%. And the council is, you know, so excited um, to have this book launched. And, you know, we had many, many questions over the past few years. We started the high school program in 2011, but over the years, we've just had more and more interest, and it's so important to help these kids with the career pathways and so forth. And there's so many out there who don't know how to start the program um, within the administrators and systems, and that's why this book is so fabulous. And like you said, it's free. So for those who want to access it, I will, if you can get a pen and piece of paper, um, basically you go to our website, www.cdacouncil.org backslash high dash school dash pathways and on there there'll be a link to access the book as well as other materials that um you'll be able to find uh, of, of interest to you most likely so dr visa any last thoughts we've had a great conversation today but i don't know are there any other new projects or publications you're working on that you'd love to share with our audience today well, I first add, thank you for that opportunity, Sandy. I first add uh, that the CDA is really the best first step. Um, if high schoolers are, are going to spend, you know, one to three years in an early childhood program at, in your school, they need to 
complete the program with a credential, an industry level credential that they can use. And I meet so many parents who uh, tell me their child was in ECE for two or three years in high school. They have nothing to show for it. They just have their traditional diploma. So having a credential when you graduate uh, here in Georgia, they could be a lead teacher with a CDA. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, based on where you are, every state is different, but I highly recommend uh, make sure they have a credential they can use. And the CDA has made a, a, done a great work around the country and abroad uh, to make sure that you made those opportunities more practical for us to achieve. No, absolutely. And it's transferable, too. I just want to add that for kids. Yeah. They don't want to stay at home and don't want this to think that, you know, you don't want them to think that this is the only state you can practice and once you have that credential you can it's 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 transitionable to any state so that's yeah. their fabulous feature too you get college credit for it so maybe they mm -hmm. have to take you know two or three classes versus you know the usual five mm -hmm. to get the next level credential but it definitely does uh, take some time off the years they would have spent paying for school so exactly. think about the free uh <laughs> Courses that you're you're not having to you're not having to pay for these courses in college because they got the credit in high school. So I right. highly recommend that. And then if they didn't get it in high school, they uh, the TDS is still transferable after that um, based on their state. And again, that's in the handbook. So I highly recommend you download it. It is how much free. <laughs> but to answer exactly. your question, um, at BCI Atlanta, what we're working on, uh, we realize that trauma informed care is very important, especially after post-COVID, uh, we tell people all the time that Black children and families have been experiencing trauma for, you know, at birth um, and beyond. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. some research says that, you know, before you were born, but, you know, there it depends on the study you're looking at. Right. So here's the thing. Since COVID, no matter what color you are, no matter what um, ethnicity you are, everyone has experienced trauma during COVID because we were in our houses for over a year, right? Absolutely. And, you know, your children were home and you had to work, you had so much, you had to juggle, you didn't make the money, you used to making so many things happen. Everyone has experienced trauma at this point in our world. So mm -hmm. uh, UCI has developed a program. We call it Strength Within. All of our programs are strong words, powerful family, Strength Within. So Strength Within is our trauma-informed care program that we speak specifically to the needs of Black children and families, their resources. We have an online self-paced course that people can take. So that's new. Uh, we also have coaching thanks to our program um, and our partners at United Way of Greater Atlanta. They are an awesome partner. And so that's one thing that's coming forward. And then if you go to our website, uh, to events. We constantly have all kinds of trainings and events. And based on the partners, sometimes they're free, sometimes they're free for members. So there's constantly a lot going on. And um, with everything else I'm doing, I'm just making sure that I support programs and implementing things like the CDA, credentials like the CDA. So I do some personal private consulting on that to support school systems and also training, because again, my goal is to make sure that the training is quality. So I do some training the trainers because um, we don't want surface training where you're just going over what you see in the book. We want to make sure that you are uh, giving real life experiences and uh, offering real life information practices for people to implement. I love research. I am a researcher myself, but we have to get to the heart of people and get to the everyday uh, ideas and information to support families. And can I share one more, uh, Sandy? Absolutely. <laughs> We, I have a, a consultant, uh, she does work with WINGS as well, and um, she was working with a program to support them in implementing their quality for accreditation, for national accreditation. Mm -hmm. And when they got to the diversity piece, they had a child who uh, who was Arabic, who had, well, they, they mm -hmm. were, um, uh, trying to remember, the um, they spoke Arabic, I'll say. Mm -hmm. And so um, she found, the teacher found the alphabet. And she posted the Hindi, Hindi alphabet. I had to remember it's been a while. And she posted the Hindi alphabet in her classroom. And the parent came in and cried. Oh. Because she, she simply included. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's so sweet. Yeah. And, and, and check. Right. She asked someone, is this the right alphabet? Because we know there are different dialects within language. Sure. 
But anyway, I just wanted to add that. So in Powerful Films and all the programs we're doing at BCDI and Wings, everything I do, uh, just trying to make sure that we recognize everyone, we leave things open-ended so no one is forgotten. And every year, every time you get a new parent, a new child, it's important to get to know them and incorporate their differences in your classroom and in your curriculum. And then we all win. You don't have to know a bunch of research. You just need to make sure you are inclusive and that you learn about those who you're working with. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that was a fabulous summary of, <laughs> of what you do and for our, our obviously uh, for the program today. So thank you so much, um, Dr. Biza, for participating and for your all your work with the council. And thank you too to our audience for tuning in today. We really appreciate it and hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.